This is the Money Hour with your host, Tina Mitchell, on Alternative Talk, AM 1150. Now, back to the show with local mortgage and finance expert, Tina Mitchell. Welcome back to the Money Hour with your host and mortgage expert, Tina Mitchell, right here on 1150 AM KKNW, the Saturday, June 14th show. I am dedicated to you, my listeners, providing you with all the tools needed to make informed decisions on everything, all matters when it comes to your money. If you're hearing my show at a different time or day, you're listening to a rebroadcast, but I am here to answer any questions that my listeners have. I'm here to share your questions and connect you directly with any guests that I have in studio. So please feel free to pick up the phone, give my show a call, 1-855-411-50. Again, that's one 855 Four hundred eleven fifty, or you can always reach me online at themoneyhour.com. And in studio right now, Mark Pellegrino with Rainier Group. And Mark's going to talk about um, uh, the financial arena and what's happening in that. We're going to talk a little bit about what's going on now, maybe some uh, predictions of what he thinks is uh, good coming up and some good advice in, in that area. Mark, thank you so much for joining me in studio for, for, for the first time. My pleasure. Good to be here. As president of Rainier Group Investment Advisory, Mark brings over 27 years to investment advisory experience to the firm, including directing equity research efforts, equity funds management, private and institutional client portfolio management, and the development of mutual fund complexes and alternative investment platform. Sounds like a wealth of information, uh, Mark, that you provide to uh, your clients. I'm really excited for you to share your wealth of information that you have in this arena to my listeners. So let's go ahead and start out with, um, we've been in a declining interest rate environment since the early 80s, which is a long time to see that. What do you see as likely the likely path of interest rates from here? Well, first, we don't think a big sustainable move higher in interest rates is immediately upon us, mm-hmm. but uh, we are expecting an acceleration in economic growth, which would probably improve the employment situation, cause, cause wage inflation to uh, creep back into the picture and, and, and other inflationary pressures. And, and with that, will likely uh, down the road come uh, a higher interest rate environment. We've been in a declining interest rate environment since 1981, which is an mm-hmm. awful long time. So easy to think that the next major move is going to be to the upside, and that will bring uh, a much bigger emphasis on different forms of fixed income investing as we go forward. Makes makes total sense. Now, there's been a lot of buzz about Michael Lewis' latest book, Flash Boys, and the subject of high-frequency trading. What are your thoughts about Mr. Lewis and what he has to offer up? Well, it certainly helped him sell a lot of books and, (laughs) uh, and of course, all the speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, it, it's clear uh, that uh, high frequency trading has uh, has impacted the investing environment uh, in pretty substantial ways, and I would say both uh, both good and bad ways. Um, I, I guess I'm mostly indignant about uh, these programs, in that uh, these high frequency trading programs, in that they're neither taking risk nor creating any value, and I mm-hmm. think that's where where people have a problem with, with with what's going on in that part of the market environment. Yeah, so you should just be really safe and careful with uh, with what you're what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about Ukraine. A conflict has been in the news throughout the last few months, and what do you feel uh, will be the effect on the global economy or even in the markets? Well, fortunately, the situation in the Ukraine has calmed a little bit in the last few weeks. Uh, that's not to say that it won't or can't flare up again. Mm-hmm. Um, If it does escalate further from here and Europe puts tougher sanctions on Russia, that does create a greater risk for Europe falling back into a mild recession given the amount of trade that they do with Russia. And that would be a tough place to be given that it's been exciting to see Europe finally raising their head out of recession and into recovery. And if you're just tuning in right now, I'm talking with Mark Pellegrino with Rainier Group. And today we're discussing what's happening uh, in the marketplace and what's what's driving it and some just really great uh, expertise uh, with 27 years in this arena. So, uh, Mark, let's talk about we've been in a, a jobless recovery since the big recession. And do you see any improvement in employment situation coming? I know you talked a little bit about uh, about employment. Yeah, we've seen some modest improvement, uh, but pretty consistent improvement in in the data that's flowing through, whether it's underemployment, uh, job openings, et cetera. 
there are still some internal concerns, however. Uh, the labor force participation rate is stuck at a pretty low level, uh, mm-hmm. and, and that just means people are leaving the, week fo- uh, the workforce, and many of them permanently. We've also seen a record high recently in temporary employment, and we know a lot of those people aren't working temporarily because they want to. It's because they can't find a permanent position. So yeah. until we see some improvement there, I don't think we're going to see big improvement on the employment front, but at least recently we're seeing um, some modest uh, help on that front. Sure. And, uh, you know, not uh, you never know what somebody's um, financial situation is and where they're at and how the economy is affecting them. But no matter how you look at it, it always is balanced out. I mean, if we've got a bad job job market, then money is cheap. And, you know, so but it depends on what side you're you're stuck on and in, in whether you're able to benefit or it's um, can be a traumatic situation for you. So first we had the Madoff scandal. And since then, highly publicized inside it trading scandals. Also, we've seen a lot more hacking techniques by um, frauders. And how do, you, how do you see these things changing in your business or how you're doing your business? How are you changing because of this? Well, it's clearly increased the degree of difficulty in what we do and that the SEC, who, who monitors firms like ours, has, has put a lot more onus on us to, uh, um, uh, to have uh, uh, programs in place that would that would stop out uh, some of those things. Things like added security, we're now encrypting emails, uh, a lot of anti-hacking procedures, bulletproofing our firewalls. So uh, we, we really tried to get out ahead of this and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and make sure that our clients weren't affected by a lot of the things that, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the, the nefarious uh, activities of a few, you know, cause us to, uh, uh, those of us who, who do it right, um, to have to uh, react to. Out yeah, there. and you know, obviously in my arena as well, in mortgage industry, after the crisis in 2008, and Dodd-Frank came out, and we're still seeing, um, the way I looked at it is, is, you know, it just got a lot of people out of the industry, because unless you really cared, unless you really love what you were doing, it's too much. I mean, there's just too much compliance and too much stuff going out, so it just weeded out all those people that were lazy and really didn't want to be here anyway. So, every time... Every time something more challenging comes up, I just tell myself that, you know what? Somebody just got out of the business. I'm not going anywhere, so it's all good. (laughs) So I see that both of the uh, the Dow and S&P 500 have recently hit new highs again. What's driving the markets right now? Well, I think it's the same things that have been driving the markets over the last few years or so. Uh, and ordinarily, it'd be economic fundamentals, but but in fact, it's been more extraneous factors. Uh, just a few things, but pretty powerful stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first of which you'll like, it's called the Tina effect. There nice. is no alternative. Really? Uh, so when you think about the fact that interest rates are still awfully low, the yields on fixed income vehicles aren't offering up the kind of competition to stock returns that they ordinarily would. There's also a lot of investor complacency out there. We're now six years removed from the worst bear market of our generation. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of investors have, quite frankly, either forgotten about or no longer care about what it, went, what it felt like to go through uh, 2008 and what kind of portfolio value was lost at that moment in time. And, of course, the Fed and the other central banks of the world have played right into that hand by continuing to inject this huge liquidity into mm-hmm. the system. And and not to be flipped, but I, I think that recipe continues until it doesn't. Yeah. No, I've, um, I, I totally agree, Mark. So how do you go about understanding your clients' return expectations and the true appetite for risk? Because I'm sure it's all, there's why I know it's individual. It is, um, and, and really built around a client's unique return expectations. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've built uh, a lot of proprietary and very sophisticated financial modeling uh, uh, tools and and platforms, and and so a lot of what we do begins and ends there. Uh, also, some other tools that have been helpful to us is a, a, a new one, which we call a risk return matrix, which uh, really tries to home in on an individual's required return and their desired return, and the level of risk that uh, that they can or are willing to assume in getting to those returns. Uh, and, and so it's a lot of tools of that nature that really mm-hmm. help us get to the empirical evidence around, uh, around an individual's um, uh, opportunity for return and, and appetite for risk. 
Sure. So, Mark, I know that there's a number of ways to manage a portfolio and investment assets, probably as many as there are investment advisory firms. So stick solely to, I know that there's some that stick solely to the traditional assets, why others believe in an alternative form of investment. How do you define alternative investments and where in the spectrum do you fall? Yeah, alternative investments um, can be a pretty broad definition, but Generally, we're thinking of them as uncorrelated assets. In other words, those that don't offer the same kind of return patterns that traditional stocks and bonds do. And in that way, they provide a, a diversifying element to a portfolio and, and really soften the return patterns. And so that would include things like emerging market debt, mm-hmm. high yield bonds, hedge strategies, global real estate, master limited partnerships, commodities, global infrastructure frontier market investments. And then we also include some opportunistic forms of investment in that where we are locking on to a theme out there and making very targeted investments in that theme. I know we've got so much. I mean, all of these categories and questions that I have for Mark, we could actually talk on one of them for the entire show. And I know that you're probably hearing something that you'd love to get more information on. If you are, pick up the phone, one 855 I can get you directly connected to Mark and get an idea of your overall uh, plan and how he can assist. Now, Mark, the argument over active versus passive investing has been raging for a number of years. Do you believe in one over the other? Well, first, that argument is one where those who believe in in passive investing would suggest that you you can't earn incremental returns in active strategies over the uh, uh, above and beyond the fees that one pays to, for active strategies. We believe differently. Uh, we've proven that you can do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, having said that, we're a bit agnostic with regard to active versus passive. We would tend to lead with active strategies because we we do believe you can achieve better returns that way. But uh, if we ever believe that in any particular asset class, we can't express our exposure in the most efficient way possible through an active strategy, we're more than willing to go passive. Makes sense. And, and Mark, I've got just a couple of seconds here, a few seconds before we go to break, and I want to wrap with one question. You've been in the business for a long time and have seen it from a number of different angles. What do you think are the hallmark of the great wealth management firm? Well, I think, um, first of all, their beliefs have to be aligned with high net worth individuals' beliefs. And we've spent a lot of time understanding what those are. I also think it's important to have a keen appreciation of both sides of the performance equation, the opportunity for return, but at an appropriate level of risk. And and we spend a lot of time in that regard as well. Also, a willingness to be tactical when the market environment calls for it. 2008 was a perfect example of that. And it was important to protect portfolio value in in what turned out to be a, a horrendous bear market. Uh, rather than just riding an investment strategy through the entire cycle, both up and down. I think it's important to put clients first and do so in both how you manage money, but also in your service culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I I think the great wealth management firms find a way to attract and foster great talent. And we've spent a lot of time seeking out really talented investment professionals. I would imagine that that last remark would be the key to a good firm is really the talent behind any industry is what's going to make or break and especially the the success of your clients. I appreciate you so much, uh, Mark, coming into studio, sharing uh, information about your firm and just providing the uh, the wealth of information again that you have to my listeners. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Coming up next in the Money Hour, escrow is a process that provides for a fair and equitable transfer of property from one owner to another. Also, make sure that the transfer of funds actually happens. A very important role when it comes to a real estate transaction is the money and making sure it gets to where it needs to go. Julie Booth with Booth Escrow right here on 1150 AM KKNW after the short break.